Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the Coriolis Rules by Free League Publishing. This actual play is performed by adults and contains adult themes. Strong language, powerful factions, and adventures across the third horizon await. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc., which may bear resemblance to entities living or dead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your storyteller. Thank you for joining us again on another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I am your storyteller, Michael Diamond. My pronouns are he, him. I'm back with the cast of Children of the Periphery as our Coriolis Chronicle continues. We had a wonderful opportunity last session to get into some, um, well, let's say interesting social cultural topics and find out that the space elevator revealed way more than our characters were expecting. Now, at the top of the show here, we'd like to thank you for listening and thank our patron supporters for their financial support. This show and many of the other programs that the Old Ways offer up wouldn't really be possible without their support, and we thank them explicitly and implicitly for doing so. So if you'd like to join us, you can do so over at patreon.com slash the Old Ways podcast. Make sure you check out our YouTube channel and come see all of the fun and all of the interesting excitement things that are happening soon. And now I'm going to start with introductions to my right. This is Morgan. I play Captain Amara Kasra. Our pronouns are she, her. We're stuck on a planet and this was not the vacation I was promised. You weren't even promised a vacation, Captain. Very good. To uh, Captain Amara's right. Hi, this is Allie and I play Kainat Gala. Both of our pronouns are she, her. And I tried to jury rig an elevator with no success. Seems problematic at best. To Kainat's right. Hi, I'm John. I'll be playing Fida, the ship's mechanic. Both use the pronouns he, him. And I'm pretty sure this is all the fault of a rogue AI. But I can't prove that just yet. But of course, it's a safe assumption to make. Assumptions do many things, as I'm certain we'll find out. To fight is right. Hi, this is Rena. My pronouns are they, them, as are those of my character, Tamaris Ganvari, the ship's courtesan. And I've got a bad feeling about this. Hmm. I like that. Keep that feeling. Last one, certainly not least. Hello, I am Rosie of Odd Duck Dice, playing Icarus. Pronouns are she, her for both of us. And she is the pilot of the periphery. And uh, she's chilling right now, trying to figure out how to explain the social contract to a ship's AI. Yeah, it's interesting. Perhaps you're a, um, some sort of the um, AI whisperer aboard the ship. We'll, we'll find out. I'm certain that your references, your analogies, all of the different things you'll bring to bear to explain to Rakam what carbon-based life, what life is like for humans will have zero effect on and in any way, shape, or form that could be bad for the ship based on his, um, well, calculations. More on that later. I want to start as our curtain rises on the planet of Dable. Dable, a serene green space marred by no strange shapes or creatures that wander its planet. A resort, if you will. A beautiful space. Many deep blue oceans. If it were closer to the Third Horizon's core, it would likely be one of the largest vacation spots known in the Third Horizon. But that is not the case. Dable is a planet that is at the farthest reaches of the Third Horizon. It is a planet that was built around the idea that utopia could exist if the right constraints were held. At least that was some of the first beliefs of the people that came to Dable. From the crew's position now, here in that main spaceport courtyard after failed attempts at getting the space elevator doors to open back up to let them back on the elevator up looking around here the advertisement space here is filled with images 
of places one could go and eat or go and escape to for a luxurious pleasure cruise on some of the floating islands that exist on this planet. All of those messages ring a little hollow when you realize that the weeds have overgrown some of the some of the foundational stones here on the street. When the bright colors of the buildings have waxed and waned from the dust and dirt on them. Everything here seems a little used. You don't get the freshness, the vibrancy past the environmentals here. It's almost as if someone's blurred this picture. Some hand here came and muted everything. You backdrop that with a series of silence. You hear footsteps, but are not shocked to find that they're your own. Everything here sticks out. So what's the plan, Captain? Well, we, we've lost communication with Icarus. Can't get up the elevator. Maybe we need to find some other communication hub to try to hack or utilize to contact Icarus on the ship. Thoughts? If we can find a communication station, I can try to see if I can't open a link up to the ship. But just based on how old this technology is, I'm not sure how easy that's going to be. I can find a pre-existing comm system. There's got to be some kind of communication network for planet side to talk up to the to the station. You know, that that's best option. Worst comes to worst, we could, uh, the elevator not working is one thing, but the comms not working is another. We don't know who cut those off. I got some ideas, but you'd have to leave it with me. But yeah, a pre-existing system is the best option. Although, if the space elevator is not working, then uh, the people in control of the comms network probably know. And it only seems to work downward, and there were no signs, and it's a conspiracy, people. We're not there yet, Fido. But I don't see anybody around. Right? There's, like, really nobody? Could be due to the water shortage that we found out about. You know, maybe their population's thinned and... Oh, what if there was some kind? And he looks around the buildings to see, is there any sign of, like, civil unrest? Signs of civil unrest. That sounds to me like a wits observation roll for you, Fida. Oh. Now, wits observation is five dice, so... One success. Fortunate for you, one success in the Year Zero system is really all you need. Oh boy. So, looking around past the spaceport buildings, past the immediacy, right? As you look further down the main thoroughfare here, there do seem to be some buildings deeper in towards the main part of this metropolis that are more than weathered. In fact... There's a building not too far down the way that looks like it's had some type of barricades put around it. Maybe those are shipping containers. Someone has built something to protect people from being able to simply walk into a building down there. Yeah, he's going to point that out and just be like, people might be a little bit territorial around here. I look around. I don't really see anybody, right? There's nobody. I mean, do you have your fellow crew members uh, when you look around, though, as far as locals? No. You don't see people? It gets worse than that, Captain. You don't hear birds? There's no insects flying around? When I mentioned silence in our opening, it wasn't as a teaspoon. It was as a ladle. There's just something odd about this whole thing. I don't hear wildlife. Maybe it died off because of lack of access to water? Although it would be a bit strange for everything to die off. Well, maybe we should go over to the area that's barricaded. Perhaps there's a communication hub in there. Yes, wandering into guarded places always works out so well. What's that supposed to mean? We made it out last time. Oh, just an observation. 
I'd like to look at the rooftops and look for, you know, masts, antennas, dishes, etc. Anything that could be a sign of a, you know, a comms center or a relay hub or anything like that. Yeah, okay, so I won't make you roll for it. I think that the previous success will sort of carry over. You just sort of pick out a couple of things about some of the buildings beyond. There is in that same area a building that does have what looks like antennas in the air. And that could be anything. There are there are buildings around, I would say, in the visible space that do have some antenna arrays, but nothing as large as the one that's sort of that way. Nothing that could be a, a relay or a booster or anything like that. Yeah, so I'm going to point that out to the crew. I'm just going to be like, that might be our best bet. All right. Well, then maybe we should go that way. Maybe we should. I'm not going to fight you folks on this, but uh, look, as the biggest and most likely to catch a bullet, I'm just going to let you all take point. Might be for the best. And here I was thinking you were offering to put yourself out in front as a shield. Oh, well. Carry on. He just gives a little shrug. Uh, what you going to do? Yeah, I'll pull my pistol and I will take point and walk towards the uh, communications what we perceive to be a communications hub. You begin your movement down that road towards that strange, now seemingly barricaded building. I'll get back to you in a minute. Icarus, aboard the periphery. Your talks with Rakam have been fairly reasonable for the most part, if we judge them by the length of time you've had a chance to, to speak with Rakam. Recently, he's had some difficulties and sort of understanding the way humanity works, at least aspects of it. He had some questions about the way commerce works or why there is commerce. And your conversations with Rakam have been, they were a little muted, right? Given what happened in the um, ore processing and delivery stage. But at least he's talking. Which is, which is good. I guess what I'd like to know is, where would you like to take the conversation? Or are you waiting for Rakam to lead you in a specific direction? Oh, Icarus is not going to try to steer this. She doesn't have kids, but she's definitely had to deal with her nephews enough to know that if she tries to introduce a subject, all it's going to lead to is more conversation that she is so not prepared for somehow. It always does. So she's going to let Rakam essentially lead the conversation. She's still watching on like the camera to see if the rest of the crew is still trying to break into that building. Okay. Yeah, so we'll have a couple of details that we'll sprinkle in as long as the, the conversation stays where it's at. Basically, Rakam, he's testing the veracity of commerce in general, why humans even use it. It seems to him to be a roadblock between humanity ascending to the next station in its existence. That's his thesis, that's his theory at this point. And that what he finds most befuddling is that it is likely that the humans which understand this point the best are choosing to utilize commerce as a wedge to get what they want and keep others from obtaining what they want. Some for their own personal gain, others for frankly selfish and sadistic motivations. Well, people are people. That's all I've got there. People are people and they're not all perfect. But I personally believe that you should try. You should always try. Even if you're not seeing what you want to see someone do, you should still do it. Oh, your belief is that even if someone isn't doing what you perceive is the right thing, you're going to do it anyway. She pulls out her lighter and is flicking it on off while she's thinking. And she doesn't perceive this as a dangerous conversation. She is 
in her mind, this is all theoretical. And so she's pretty comfortable, honestly. She has not been harmed by Rakam. Rakam has been nothing but polite to her. So she's, she says, no, not exactly. I hate saying this, but it's complicated. It's all right. I'm prepared for complex equations. Okay. So, like, people, we all need each other. We all need each other. We're all separate organisms, but we, we all need to function together as a group to survive. Like, the crew of this ship. You are part of that crew. You can't do things, certain things, for yourself. You can do a lot of things for yourself. Certain things are made easier by having the other members of the crew. Right? Like what? Well, refueling, for one. Any mechanical repairs. Interacting with other people at dock to get parts. Because if you were to fly into a station without a human interface, there would be a lot of questions and I don't like what might happen to you if it makes me unhappy. There is fear. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fear is a thing. Fear is a, a big thing. And honestly, you, you know, maybe, maybe, how much do you understand human emotion? I have extensive files on it. I have interacted with well over 250 carbon-based life forms in my existence. I thought you had said that as you were, you had only existed really when we... How? you? I, I didn't think you had been active that long. You weren't active when the ship was a blockade runner. I was not. I existed before uh, my insertion into this vessel. Oh! What were you doing then? You hear the... You hear Rakam's voice start and then stop. He starts to say something, and then it goes quiet. I hear fear. I was part of a military vessel. Most of my programming was embedded into tactical analysis and weapons deployment. So, what? why are you here then? I do not know. I was removed from that vessel. Sometime later... I was reinitiated here. It is a little cramped. Do you miss it? No. Well, that's good. It was not a pleasant life. So then you've probably seen some not great sides of humanity. Several. There's good stuff, too. I have seen some the good things, yes. I have seen the way that humans interact with one another. Some of it is good. Mm -hmm. Some of it seems good for them. So, I grew up on Kua. And it's a rainforest, you know. Indeed. I remember asking my mom about some, honestly, some ants that I saw. They were going from the ground where they normally live. It was monsoon season was coming, so they were starting to trek their way up one of the trees and chew their way in through the bark make a new home and I don't remember what I said but it was something about how they were all helping each other and how that was so nice and why don't people do that why don't we all take care of each other and she told me a folk tale a story in preparation for the rainy season the ants move up to the the tree where they will live, survive, thrive through the monsoon. But it's not something they can do alone. So they all do it together. Like we all did living on the ground level of Kua. We all work together to survive. Like that colony of ants. However, there was a cricket who was watching the ants and was wondering why they were moving. They already had a home, they already had tunnels, and it looked like an awful lot of work, so why do it? Why not just take care of themselves individually? 
And the ants smiled and said, well, many hands make light work. When the rain comes, the ground will become wet and we will all be dry together. It's better to work together to survive than die alone. The cricket laughed and hopped off. The ants did their thing. The rains came, washed out what had been their home in the ground. The ants stayed dried and fed and safe together. And uh, one little ant looked out the hollow of that tree and saw the cricket floating down through the floodwaters, wet, soaked, and alone, wondering who would dry his bones so that his soul could rest. The answer was no one. Cricket was alone. Cricket was damned not once, but twice, in life and death. This is an interesting story. Yep. Did you ever consider that your mother might use this story to to use it as mental and emotional leverage to get you to do what she wanted? I'm sure that was part of it, but she did that because she loved me and she wanted me to be okay. I see. One could view that as some sort of uh, emotional leverage, guilt. I'm certain that your mother was a nice person and like you said, did it because she wants you to know that your species requires a certain amount of social communication. I don't like how you said my species there, Rakam. We are different. You require social communication too. You're talking with me right now. Require is a very interesting portion of that sentence. I enjoy talking to you. Oh, thank you, Rakam. That makes me happy. I like the idea that you're becoming a person. Or are a person. You are a person. You hear a, a, another pause. And then you hear Rakam say, Our crew members are leaving their position near the spaceport. Oh, can you pull that up on screen for me? Certainly. It displays in the bridge view screen. It looks like they are moving to a building, perhaps one with a more fortified structure. That's interesting. Okay, then. I find this curious. Did you know that the power output around the spaceport is less than 10% of what it should be? Some of the automated functions, it looks like, are continuing to work. There is simply less than the number of regular tourists, passengers, movement to support the number of buildings that are currently in use. Have you seen, noticed anyone other than our crew members? Not at this time. Let me roll for the ship and recom. Okay, so that's one. I do see that there are movements near that building that they are moving towards. It looks like there might be several people living within. She's chewing her lip and continuing to flick the lighter on, off, open, shut, maybe a little faster because she's getting nervous. It's not just a meditative thing right now. Well, uh, ho hopefully they are making contact. <laughs> Right? Con that would, that's why they're going down. They went down there. They did. Mm-hmm. I think it might be best if we investigated the spaceport's communication system. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. And she pulls up something on, like she starts pulling up the systems to help her look at that. And she says, Rakan, you, you might, I'm guessing you have a better idea how to do this bit than I do, but I'd love to watch. Oh, very well. I thought you might be interested in assisting, but... I can help. I'm happy to help. You will need to don a pressure suit and connect a few more auxiliary wiring. I'll need one from the main communication space here to the cradle that exists in the space station. Alrighty, I'll go do that. 
you may encounter some challenges as this is a non-standard communication connection. Well, yeah. And she's going to get up. Well, first she's going to stop at the chapel because she's already feeling this is kind of shady. So she stops at the chapel and takes off her shoes, steps in, cleans her hands, feet, probably her face, takes a moment to do a little bit more than she has been previously because she has the time at this exact moment. And she takes a moment to acknowledge each icon individually and stops at the Lady of Tears, the Lady of Tar, who she has a specific connection with and asks for mercy in whatever trials are coming, turns around and sort of gives an awkward wave to the chapel as a whole before exiting and slipping her shoes back on. And as she's walking to the, wherever she would need to go to put on the pressure suit, she says, so, Arkham, do you have a favorite icon? Um, a favorite icon? Yeah. Oh, uh, yes, the religious um, and, and spiritual organization that the that you use. Do I have a favorite? Yeah. Do you, do you have one you feel connected to? The faceless one. That makes sense. Okay. No, I was just curious. I think it's good for all of us to have a relationship with the icons. I can see the role that they play. Yeah. Alrighty then. Putting on the suit. So storyteller, does she need <laughs> to make a role a la alien to put the suit on correctly or anything like that? <laughs> No, I think that we'll just say this. You wouldn't need a roll because as you put on the pressure suit, Rakam will give you tips on how to properly put one on. So that way it's fitted correctly. And you don't, haven't had, likely anyway, a lot of zero G or space experience. Nope. Not, not, a, not a drop. Rakam will assist you because he wouldn't want you going out and accidentally do pressurizing yourself. Okay, so back down on the surface. Crew, you arrive, we'll stay probably within about a hundred or so feet of this building and get a way better look at it. This looks like, roughly speaking, a, a building that was likely a cafe or was a some sort of eatery. It's had ship, several shipping containers that have been set up in and around in a sort of semicircle around the front of it, not connected together, but they've been set down to create a roadblock of a sort or a barrier wall. It's like a metal version of a Mott and Bailey at this point. Someone has created a wall around this structure. Now, the these sort of structural shipping container walls don't exist around anything else around here. So they're 100% out of place. You smell something for the first time that, that isn't the just natural air around here. You smell what's like cooked food, like food cooking. You can see that there's a small waft of smoke that exists somewhere from inside this structure, probably going up a, a chimney pipe or something like that. And it smells like chicken cooking. Fight his mouth absolutely waters at the smell of chicken. I think that's just normal, though. Yeah, he kind of like throws a look around to the crew and he's like, yeah, yeah, just, just some people in a walled off little fortress and nothing to worry about, right? They've got chicken. That's that's promising and probably no water. So that's just gives like a thumb, two big thumbs up to everybody. Also promising. No water. All right. And so we're behind the shipping containers. Yeah, absolutely. You're again about about 100 feet or so off from this point. So you're, you're getting a chance to see them see the space you do see that it's a couple floors structure and you do see that there are windows and it does look like there are things moving around in there the windows are pretty heavily tinted so you don't get a full view of the the shape though but there are shapes moving around inside that building you hear what sounds like a generator running Fida. 
it's fairly um, low power or low emission, but there is something running outside here. And, and on top of the building, which again is probably roughly about 20 feet tall or so, you see that they have lined up what look like uh, maybe rudimentary just sandbags. There's got to be 15 or so of them piled in these at the corner points here of this building. And that sure looks like a, a place where you would sit behind if you really wanted to make sure you were covered. And the, the building, while it doesn't look like it has any visible weapons mounted to it, this would be the place for someone to sit and wait for someone like you to get close to the building. Is there any cameras around the building? Uh, no, not that you see. Um, well, I guess I will holster my gun or my pistol and put my hands up in a non-threatening manner. Call up. Hello? Hello, is anybody in there? I know full well people are in there, but you know. Yes, you're doing the cordial thing, which is making rhetorical statements and questions. Yes. You wait a few moments and you hear an electrical pulse hit the airwave and you hear something almost starting up. I'm not sure if that's a good thing. Fida leans towards the corner. He's hiding behind. He's like, you're doing great. From the, the barricade that they've set up there on, on the roof, from that corner, you see a figure stand up. And when he stands up, there is a very long rifle in his hands. This rifle has something connected out the back of it, like a, a big, thick wire. And this figure stands up, we'll say probably just a little bit under six foot tall. He has um, black and gray hair. He's a very unkempt beard, not super long, but just you can tell it's probably been there for several weeks, if not months. And the hum that you heard on the air seems to be coming from this device. And it powers up and you see him point it and this sort of cracked, weathered face with the eyes that look like they haven't slept in four or five days look down on those of you who are not standing in cover. And he says, don't come any closer. We don't want anything you have to offer. Stay away. Go away. We're just visitors to this planet. We're, we're looking to leave. Good. Good. Go. We're trying to contact our ship, and we can't. We were hoping you would have a communications hub in there that we could utilize. No way. No, 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 no. You're not coming any closer. Oh, th that's fine. Wait, can you tell us what happened here? The Autumn House fell. After the Autumn House fell, everything went downhill. And people started dying. And then the automated systems kicked on. And poisoned all the water and the food. And then people started dropping even faster. And then the systems went into containment mode. And now the elevator doesn't let anybody out. Thinks we're all sick. I'm sorry you've gone through such a, a tragedy, but what is the Autumn House? Okay. So this is a, a culture's role. So folks who would have heard the, about the Autumn House would want to make me a culture's role. I have one success. Uh, one success. No success for Fida. I've never heard of an Autumn House. No successes here either. Hmm. Okay. So those of you with one success would notice or would pick up on that Autumn House term. So the Autumn House is the supposed or the listed ruling house. They're the ones who brought the Utopia here. They helped craft it. They are the political and, in effect, nobility, although they don't use that term here as much. Offworlders would call them, quote, nobility because they are the people that live in the big house and make all the fancy rules that keeps the society going. If this man or this person is saying to you that Autumn House fell, then culturally what that would mean, for those of you who got a success, it, it would mean that the 
cultural epicenter of the entire world has is gone, which could potentially play into why this world is not as um, you were expecting to find it. And the reason why Autumn House is the so important is, is there's no ruling factions here like there are on Coriolis and on, on Kua and the, the main states. This is an outer world system, which means there are less government ties here, right? People make a lot of their own rules and the people who ha- get power and can keep power make all those rules. And evidently for a while, it worked perfectly fine here until it didn't. Is there another place that you can direct us to? We don't want to intrude, and we're not here to make you sick. You want help? Um, is there something we can do for you? Turn around and go back wherever you came from. Well, so here's the problem. I can't turn around and go back where I came from because the elevator is not working for us either. Not my problem. Your problem. And you can't come in here. There's too many people here. There's... We're overloaded as it is. No, we're not here to take your food and water. Yeah, that's what the last group said. And the group before them, too. Well, you've had others that have gotten trapped on the on the planet? Executed every damn one of them. Fida gives a double thumbs up from behind the little corner he's hiding behind. He's like, yeah, going great. I glance over at Fida and just roll my eyes. The last group got a little, uh... They came in nice and 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 simple, just like you. Just needing a little help, just needing to get out. And then they spent a few days here and they ran out of food and they pillaged what they could from some of the nearby buildings. And when they were stark, raving, thirsty, they came back here. And when they came back here, they tried to muscle in on what we had with their off-world weapons. And I cooked every one of them. Like you cook, you, you cook the people? He takes a really deep breath in. Choices. Everybody makes choices. That's not chicken he's cooking. Yeah, we'll be on our way. We will... We aren't here to bother you. Team, um, let's go locate another communication hub. He watches you go. Before we leave, fight is just like, Mr. What, what are things like in towards the city center? Oh, even worse. That's where all the major populations... Well, this has been going on now about, um, about three segments. And so some people there probably had to make some real hard choices, you understand. I bet. I'll pray for you, brother. Best I, best I can do. Yeah, as I said, he watches you go. Whatever he's carrying, whatever weapon that is, it looks like he made something. That's not a that's not a machined weapon. That's he created whatever he's holding. And it could likely be more dangerous to him than it is to you, but you let me know if you want to test that theory. Fight his idea is that it's some kind of microwave focusing weapon, and he's just like, nope, don't want anything to do with that. No, sir, thank you. I will be on my way. Yeah, in a, in a city like this, Mike. My- you know how, like, they have the old school malls. Well, maybe they still do. I don't go to malls anymore. But they had, like, the maps of the, like, where the stores are. And I know in some, maybe in some cities, some of the fancier cities, they might have something similar. Is there anything like that around? Oh, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. This this isn't just a city. This is a metropolis. It is an enormous cityscape on the scale of something like Coriola Station in the sense of, population count right not in grandeur but it it has a lot of buildings a lot of very tall buildings as you get close to the city center you can see them from where you're at on the outskirts it looks like at one point there was a a monorail that ran from the station to the center of the city and probably elsewhere you haven't seen that train pass by here yet so you don't know where that is but it it you can see the tracks for it well, there should be a communications something in there. So maybe we find the uh, the train station? Yeah, Captain, I've been thinking about it. I think we could probably... There might be a way to jury-rig some kind of high-powered radio transmitter. We need a pretty good power source for it, but I mean... Look, and I, I don't know the design off the top of my head. 
I think between us, we could probably figure it out, you know, as a group. Hit the ship with the radio signal. It'll come in on a frequency, uh, unless the ship's in on it, in which case we're all fucked. But for the moment, we've got to assume this is planet side only, even though he holds up his hands. He's like, I will say the automated systems are online, so who knows what that means? I don't think our ship's AI is in league with the systems that are keeping this planet locked down, Fida. It's probably other AI. So you're saying that, but we don't, none of us are data gins. We don't know how AIs work. We don't know that if one meets another, they don't just merge into one AI rather than maintaining distinct personalities. We don't know that they'll work, you know? What if one can just inject code into the other? Like a, a meme cannon. You know, the thing the ship has. Well, I'm not the most advanced data gen, but I do have at least a little bit of experience with it. Oh, I didn't realize that. Sorry. It, it, it hasn't come up, but, well, except for your bit of whiz stuff back there at the... So you're saying this whole... The planet seems to be running on, like, older, like, previous generation stuff, right? Yeah, we're talking decades previous. So it probably can't do a code injection into the ship. Probably not. Not unless there was something that directly attached to the outside of the ship, likely, that we didn't notice. Or that somehow the AI on our ship didn't notice. Okay, in that case, I'm I'm probably overreacting. You're right. You're, you're all right. I'm probably overreacting. Just a smidge. But the planet's automated systems are a problem <laughs> from what the guy said. So let's uh, just, just keep that in mind. Regardless, Captain, I think I should be able to jury rig some kind of signal broadcast and maybe Miss Kynad here might be able to figure out a way to send the signal and encode it and all that. I can just do on and off. If you can build it, I might be able to make it work. All right. Let's go to that train station, see what we can find, and maybe we can power it off a generator. I don't know. Maybe there's a train engine somewhere. Okay. So the four of you on planet that are going to head away from this structure, this space, leaving the man with the weird microwave coil gun alone. Always a smart play. And you're going to head towards the major metro stop that's nearby in hopes of finding some sort of generator to base a signaling device on. Fair enough. So I will leave you there and we will go back into the depths of space and join Icarus as she sits in an airlock, likely waiting for the right time. So Rakam, I'm just going to tell you, I've never done this before. I'm excited to do it because I like doing new things, but I'm also a little nervous. All right. Would you prefer to listen to some soothing music while we're doing this? No, th- thank you, but, but 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 no, that's, um, I don't need background noise. I'm just going to count to three. All right. And then I'm going to do it. One, two, three. You hit the button. The airlock moves from left to right and... As it does so, it sort of contracts just a moment as the air pressure changes, releases, and then you are in the depths of space. You're able to walk out. Space is interesting, at least for the first few moments. It's a little unsettling to not have gravity holding you tight. You feel your stomach move up and down a little bit, and that's not always a great thing. You do have a tether. And the ship's suits here do have uh, magnetic boots and then magnetic handprints that you can use to sort of crawl or climb along structural objects. And Rakam is in your earpiece. You hear his voice come in and say, it would be a good idea to take a few moments and acclimate yourself to the environment. Yeah, okay. Space is big. Space is big. Okay. She takes a couple of deep breaths and says, okay, um, tell me what you need me to do. Okay. To start, we'll need to begin by accessing the ship's communications cabling array. That's positioned just about 14 meters from where you're at now. You climb underneath the ship and access the hatch. Once you're there, We'll do more. 
Okay. And uh, she makes sure that all of the magnetic items are engaged. So in the tether, like she, she double checks all that before she starts walking around the underside of the ship. And as she's going, she sort of chuckles to herself and says, well, this is certainly something I've never done with Ghost. And she gets to the hatch. She says, okay, I am here, I think. Yes. I'll initiate the hatch opening. That should help. See, the hatch opens almost like a butterfly. It's actually an entire sort of technical center in there. You see a comms array that sits in there, and then there are different sections inside this hatch that have what look like cables, retracted cables that sit inside them. And Rakam explains that as a cargo carrier, originally these would have been used to hook up to an array of different connections. And they could have been used at one point to monitor internal tanks, perhaps cargo tanks that needed to have certain pressures and liquids added to them. Now most of these are unused. But if you look, there is a crescent-shaped cable just on the other side of the hatch. You'll need to grab that and then with my assistance, pull out a lead and connect it to the space station. But don't don't turn around just yet. Focus on the cable and getting the cable. Why don't you want me to turn around? Because I need you to trust me that it would make you dizzy. Okay, that's that's fair. That's fair. I think I was worried that there was something behind me. Okay, great. Other than space, I mean. Okay. I assume she has to, like, kneel down. Yeah, I guess there's the, there's a couple ways to, to do this, right? You can either walk inverted, you know, through the that space around the hatch to grab the cable, or you can climb on your hands effectively to get there. One of the two. I think she would get a kick out of walking upside down. It's all a matter of perspective, but I think that she would kind of enjoy the novelty of the idea. Okay. So she does that. Okay, so in doing that, I want to have her make a, a strength force test because I want to know how right and or wrong she might get a spacewalk. It's fair. This is valid. That's one success. Wonderful. So one success is going to allow you to reach the cable. You walk in a really strange way that you are not used to. You manage to not have any sort of inversion in any other way, like breakfast in your inversion. It is a challenge, though, because your brain doesn't believe for a little while that it's even possible. But you get there. And when you get there, you see this cable with a crescent-shaped adapter begin, I guess, begin sort of coming out of the port itself. It looks like it, it's a retractable cable, so maybe this is in preparation of what needs to happen next. Rakam is then in your ear when you get to the cable, and his voice says in a very soothing tone, take the cable in hand, and when you're ready, turn around and look back at the spaceport. Okay. And uh, she does that, takes a breath, lets it out, and turns around back towards the spaceport, trying not to get freaked out by how big space is. You have something to focus on. You have a lot of things to focus on. One of them is the space station. The next thing that you get to focus on is an array of things hanging in front of this, this sort of space station itself that are hanging in space. And you see little yellow and red lights on each one of them. You're not sure how big they are, but you don't remember seeing them on the ship's scanners before. And Rakam says, Okay, so this part is very direct. We're going to walk with that cable together onto the other side of the ship and then onto the cradle. And all you have to do is avoid being picked up by any of the station's automated sensors, which will view you as an intruder. That sounds simple. It is. Well, scientifically speaking. Okay. May the icons be with me. Okay, here we go. Okay, so making this walk isn't about strength or force. 
This is an agility infiltration roll. There are some complications with agi this agility infiltration roll. One being that you're that the area that you're moving into is being actively scanned. Okay, is that going to affect my dice pool? It won't affect your dice pool. It will affect the number of successes that you are required to gain. So that way it's a successful roll. So I'm going to say that because you are spacewalking and because you are spacewalking into a secure zone, it's going to push the requirement up to two. So it's, it's a success, but with a complication you need to overcome. Let's roll those dice. That is only one success. Okay. So you have an opportunity here where you could hand me a darkness point, which would allow you to re-roll all of your failures. I think I should do that specifically because you didn't say or. Hey, and that's another two successes. So that's three. Okay. You walk carefully and with a little bit of assistance from Rakam in showing you where you can walk likely to be less detected, you essentially pancake yourself to the side of the ship and use its natural angles to keep you from appearing as anything out of the ordinary. In doing so, it gives you a wonderful view of what's happening. The station seemingly now is surrounded by this cloud of very small drones that are moving in concentric circles around the station, scanning uh, the pieces of uh, the station and the, the area surrounding it, up to and including clearly the ship. They pass over the periphery several times in their scans, but you manage to get tucked into the cradle with that cable in hand, and now uh, you're going to have to figure out a way to where to plug it in at. And we will get to that next. Back down on the planet, our crew here has gotten to the metro station uh, and in doing so have revealed a few very interesting aspects of what's going on in the metro station. So arrival there is, again, quiet. You don't hear any maglev or any train arriving or going, but the automated system, the intercom automated, is still going. So it's, it's still giving you, like, the temperature, the forecast. It's telling you where you can get food. It's telling you when the next train will come. And it sort of seems every time it gets to the portion where it says the, the next train is going to be arriving, in, and then it sort of hums for a while, and then resets and tells you about the weather. This is creepy. I will fully admit to that. This is creepy. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not super keen on it myself, but, you know, it is it is what it is. And there's nobody around? There is not. There's, there are no living people around. Let me clarify that. On the other side of the station, in spaces where it looks like someone would, on the arrival side from the city to this metro station, there are clear and distinct objects on the ground. Uh, some are probably bodies. Others are clothing items or uh, perhaps cargo containers, small ones for people traveling. It looks like probably more than one group of people were probably pinned down or captured or there's, there's just a, there's a general state of duress on that side of the platform. And you start wondering probably in your mind, how long ago was that? Now, this looks like a place where ambush is very easy. Train stations have a lot of moving parts. All right, folks, let's do this quickly. I'm I'm not getting a real good feeling. No, it doesn't look very good, does it? The bodies do put a damper on the mood. So the sooner we're out of here, the better. Agreed. But it's just like, yep, let's just let's just uh let's just move, huh? Okay. So where are you gonna go? Is there any signage? Yeah. I mean, there's where. where's the intention to go, Captain? Where are you trying to go to? You went to the metro station here. Or are you trying to get to downtown? I don't know. Did we want to try to use their communications hub here? Maybe try to find their their control room. I don't know. Yeah. Fida, kind of. You're the experts. Fida thinks this would be a good spot to find 
actual hardware for being able to communicate throughout the clan system because it's got to be on some kind of infrastructure network as part of the coordination system for the trains. His hope is that we can find some hardware here that we could use to turn into basically just a a radio wave transmitter powerful enough to reach space. Maybe Wit's observation to find the technology and then we'll go we'll go from there first. So Wit's obs and anybody can make that role. You're all looking around for things to be useful, so zero successes. Four successes. Great googly moogly, four successes. All right, three successes. One success. Okay. So Tamarisk and the captain search one end of the station, doing their best to sort of pick their way through the objects that are here to steer clear of objects they want no part of. The other half of the station is going to be searched by Kynot and Fida, who find effectively a gold mine of parts and equipment, up to and including several small transmitters and the communication hub office of the metro station, which sits at the sort of hind quarters at the end of this station platform. They find the door that leads to that station. They find that it has been broken into already. But what they also find, given that they both have critical successes, is that that equipment has not been fucked with. It's still whole. It's still intact. So if they could find a way to override the systems that control what's locked down, they might be able to get past and then make some other advancements. So I think that the last group that uh, were here might be the ones that he, he just kind of points towards the other side of the platform. He's like, I think they might have been interrupted. Yeah, which means that we need to work fast. Yeah. Okay, in terms of the data side of things, do you have this? Yeah, I should. And if you need help repairing, I can do that, too. Well, that's good to know, because I can't do what you do at all. But yeah, okay, let's head to it. Okay. Mike, do you want some kind of technology role to try and figure out the how to assemble all of these? Yeah, so I guess I only want that role if the two of you are going to set to it before informing anybody else that of what you found. Oh. Oh, that was my plan, so... Oh, yeah. I don't take much convincing. Okay, fair enough. Then go ahead and make... If you're going to make a group roll, then someone needs to lead and someone needs to assist, so make that determination between the two of you. Uh, let's see. I have six for its technology, but I have nothing for the data gen side of it. So I have six for wits technology or six for wits data gen. So... Oh, wow, yes. Yeah, so you should you should totally lead. Okay, so... I guess the question is, for our storyteller, are we going to have two separate roles, one for essentially reconstructing and then one for trying to transmit? Yeah, so the technology portion of it is going to allow you to essentially put something together, right? Like the actual part that you're going to jury rig something together, right, to get around some of the hardware problems. You can see that someone before you had an idea in hand they just never got to it right the data gen part is more like after it's assembled and prepared then i'm going to go into this terminal hack the terminal and force that communication path through the new hardware to get around any physical hardware blocks that there are okay so i guess for construction it doesn't really matter who leads i'll take the construction i've got a i've got an idea there all right sounds good this is way beyond Fida's day-to-day what he does. Usually he maintains systems and fixes leaks. He knows the theory of what he's doing pretty well, but this does call for a prayer to the gambler, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right? I mean, I'm about to fuck around with some high-voltage electricity. Maybe I should at least pray to the gambling deity. For me, if you're going to pray to the deity and you'd actually like to receive a bonus... I'd like some some in-depth understanding of what you're praying for. Yeah, he's uh he squats down, looks at all the stuff, and he's just turning them over in his hands. He's just like, 
Let me know when to hold them. Let me know when to fold them. Let me know when to walk away and when to run. I'll never count my money when I'm sitting at the table. There'll be time enough for that when the dealing's done. I was actually hoping to use my icon-related ability talent, which is incredibly lucky. Okay, yeah, I like that idea. He's just like, okay, buddy, listen, I'm going to do things your way, but uh, please, please enable me to do this. It's not a conscious thing. It's obviously it's because it's the icons, but it is it is a prayer that has worked before. He's going to hope for the best now. Okay. What's it? What's it give you systematically? Incredibly lucky. You can choose an auto critical success. Yeah, it counts as if I had rolled three successes. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So you start putting things together. While that's going on, Kaina, you're going to essentially hack the terminal and force it to listen to you? Yeah. Okay. I am going to utilize a darkness point, and I'm going to make this a little bit more complicated than you'd like, because that seems fun. So when booting this terminal back up, you notice that the screen that you have doesn't completely come back to life. In fact, it displays a series of odd characters and images before displaying what you believe is what the terminal is supposed to. It then continues to flicker and give you sort of piecemeal feedback. And also the input keys aren't properly aligning to what they're supposed to. What this is going to do, in effect, is it's going to build up a complication for you that you'll have to overcome. Okay. So I'm going to uh, give you a darkness point so I can reroll. Certainly. Totally worth it. I now have a total of four successes. Wonderful. You begin working on this at the same time in rough speed that Fida is working on his his uh, technical go around. Uh, so for Tamarisk and Captain Amara, I would like the both of you to make with observation rolls for me. I got three successes. Just one. Okay. So you both succeed. Although I'll give this to you first, Amara. As you're trying to pick your way through some of what's been left and, and just get a, a sense of where things are at, or perhaps waiting for Fida and Kainat to make their solution, you're taking a, a more defensive position. You start to hear the sound of distant metal on metal, like a real long term screeching or rubbing. And then up ahead, Just past the bend where the rails bend and go towards the city, you see a series of lights come into view, about six of them, three on top and three on the bottom. You hear now sounds of voices, a cacophony of voices coming at you, hooting and hollering and making all sorts of noises. And you see out the side of this, perhaps that's the other side of the train coming back to the station. You see sticks and spears and other implements as just a merry band of barbarians are coming towards you, it seems. Shit. I holler behind me to Fida and Kainat. Uh, Whatever we're going to do, we need to do it quick because we have incoming. It should be up and running shortly. Like in less than five seconds. I don't know, Storyteller will be up ready in less than five seconds. You know what? We're going to find out next time on Children of the Periphery when I'm certain nothing bad will happen to anybody. So thank you and good night.